Amen. Thank you so much, Tyler, for serving us today. Hasn't that been incredible for him to lead with us the last several weeks? If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, find 1 John chapter 4. We've been working our way through John's letters, looking at big questions and John's big answers to those questions. Let me first say, before we dive in, Happy Father's Day to the fathers in the room, and let me encourage you, if you're able today, to call your dad or a father figure that you had uh, in your life and tell them thank you, maybe take them fishing or buy them some good meat, right, <laughs> and tell them you love them, right? We're so thankful we've got many godly uh, male leaders and fathers here in this church, and we're so thankful uh, for them. Uh, and for those that were raising up. So excited to be here. First John chapter 4. We live in a day and age where the latest news <coughs> and happenings has never been more accessible, yet trust in the mainstream media has hit a near record low. A recent Gallup poll, this is from September 2021, shows that 63% of those surveyed said they, quote, had not very much trust or, quote, none at all when it comes to the media. In fact, I don't think this is simply a problem with the media. Just about every major institution has suffered some sort of public loss of public trust. Frankly, it's really a culture-wide issue, and let me tell you, it spans both sides of the political aisle and all the ideologies there in between. It's even made its way into the church. And while we might be in a unique season as a culture, the issue of mistrust is nothing new. John is writing this letter to a group of churches in, in Ephesus in the first century, and they were in a defining moment. Trust was weak, and he was writing to them because they were having their own problem with fake news there at the church at Ephesus. And so they were left asking this question, how do I know who to listen to? How do I know who to listen to with all this spiritual teaching, all this faith teaching? Out of, how do I know who in the world to listen to? And this is where John turns in 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to read the whole chapter and look what uh, the Holy Spirit has to tell us through John this morning. 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God, and you have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us, given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. 
There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with judgment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we heard from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of God. John has a level of awareness here that we all need. John is not influenced by the modern world that would see the physical world and go no further. John is aware that behind the natural world we see is a supernatural world at work. He wasn't a secularist or a naturalist. He knew that there were unseen forces, both good and bad, behind the happenings of the world. John is able to hear a teaching and recognize something that we all need to know. That behind every teaching is a spirit at work. Behind every teaching that you hear is a spirit at work. Remember that John had finished off chapter 3 talking about the Holy Spirit being given to us. But now he wants to remind us that there were also unholy spirits at work too. Look at 1 John 4, 1. Look at this. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many prophets have gone out into the world. John says that behind every teaching is a spirit and that we must test the spirits to discern what is true. We must test the spirits to discern what is true. Here the word test is used for discerning the purity of metals, acknowledging the truth or reality of something. While John has in mind spiritual teaching here, the Apostle Paul echoes the same encouragement in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He tells us that we're to test everything and hold fast to what is good. As Christians, we are called to test and discern what we hear. So often believers are painted as being gullible or believing everything we hear, yet faithful Christian living requires us to test everything we hear, to discern what is true and false, to turn on our brains and to stay engaged in the Holy Spirit and to test everything. Behind every teaching and behind every teacher is a spirit at work. I want you to look at verse 1 again. Look closely at what, Paul, at what John's telling us here. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Why? For many false prophets have gone out into the world. The issue isn't simply the teaching, but also the teacher. The reason why we need to test the false spirits is because there are false prophets that have gone out into the world. Jesus warned as much in Matthew chapter 24. He warned that there would be false prophets and false teachers. And we're just as much in need as John's audience to test who to listen to and not to listen to. Can I just tell you something? Just because somebody has a faith-based TV show or they wrote a book, or they went to seminary, or they have a following, doesn't mean that there's not an evil force at work behind them. And that they're not trying to deceive you and lead you astray. And so John gives us three tests in this chapter to test, to enable us to discern the spirits, and to kind of begin to discern who to listen to. Listen to three tests to discern the spirits. And he starts first with the first test, which is the doctrinal test. The doctrinal test. John puts first things first. 1 John 4, verses 2 and 3. Look at this. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard was coming and now is in the world already. He starts by saying, you recognize the Spirit by its doctrine. The first way to judge Holy Spirit teaching from unholy Spirit teaching is simply by what in the world they're saying. 
And he wants to remind us that word and spirit are not opposed to one another. The Holy Spirit will never lead you away from truth because truth and spirit are not enemies but friends. Specifically, there's a couple questions that you can do to begin to discern the doctrinal test. And the first question is, who does the teacher exalt? Who do they exalt? Who are they making much of? Because John's clear, not all spirituality is good and true. This might be unpopular for some to hear, but not all religions are the same, and not all so-called truth is really true. We recognize the Holy Spirit by how he points to and exalts Jesus. In fact, John tells us as much back in the gospel that he wrote. And, and in that gospel, he talks all about the Holy Spirit. Here's one example of what he says. John 16, verse 13 and 14. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Hear this. If the teacher is exalting anyone other than Jesus, they are being led by the Spirit. If they're always pointing to themselves then they are not being led by the Holy Spirit. If they want you to find your hope and your foundation in any other source other than Jesus, then friends, that is from an unholy spirit and not from the Holy Spirit. By this, we know the Holy Spirit. Do they confess Jesus? Do they exalt Him? Is He the Lord over their life and over their teaching? But he has much more in mind than simply who they profess. Because, let me tell you something, false teaching is a lot more careful and a lot more subtle. There's plenty of false teaching that will use the name of Jesus and make lots of Jesus, but describe someone or something other than the Jesus of the Bible. That's why, that's why John would have us ask the second question, what do they teach about Jesus? So who does the teacher exalt? Who does he make much of? But who, what does he teach about Jesus? Notice John's words again back in verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. He's saying you've got to have the right Jesus. The false teachers in Jesus' day were denying the humanity of Jesus. See, he said, hey, these false teachers were speaking, that they were saying that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. He didn't come to earth incarnated as a true man. And for these false teachers, it was easy to believe that Jesus was God. But they struggled to believe that he walked around with flesh and bones and got hungry and was a man. And that meant because he didn't have a real body, that he only appeared to die. And friends, it created all kinds of weird teachings that were going around in John's day. But false teaching comes in all shapes and sizes. It wasn't simply a denial of Jesus' humanity. It can look like a denial of Jesus' divinity. Look over 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. Look at this. By this we know that we abide in him and him in us, because he's given us of his spirit. And we've seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. John grounds us. You can recognize the true teacher and the Holy Spirit by their true doctrine. And notice the kind of teaching that John puts the emphasis on. He calls this teaching, teaching of the Antichrist, which echoes back to chapter 2. These weren't really minor areas of doctrinal disagreement, or even things the Bible might not be as clear on, or even some of the hot-button issues that many of us like to often divide over. He says that false teaching is reserved for those who get the very heart of the faith wrong, who get the person of Jesus wrong. Notice he makes reference to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in the passage. These are folks who might get the Trinity wrong. You can think about folks who would deny something like the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or some of these early sort of 
put, put ways of putting together and understanding what the scriptures say. He's going to go on to say that Jesus laid down his life for a propitiation for our sins. And if they get the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus wrong, they've got false teaching. This is issues that were core to the very, to the very uh, faith that was around them. But also notice John was putting the emphasis on false teaching that was popular at the time. He was putting the emphasis on where the people were being tempted in the moment to waver on. Whatever the controversy of the day was, that was where John wanted to apply the test. And friends, we can think in our day of all kinds of areas where the truth of God's word is being challenged. And I'd say one of the best, one of the highlighted areas is really what we understand about the doctrine of man. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to have what does it mean to be to have life in the womb? What does it mean for man to be married? What does it mean from a, from the in terms of anthropology for a person to be created in the image of God? This is really where the war is in our culture today. And these areas of doctrine matter. We need the word of God through the apostles to discern truth from error. In fact, hear this. What might be popular in the world today is exactly the wrong place to look for truth. Friends, it was once popular in the world for people to sacrifice their children in the volcanoes. Wouldn't want to go back to that time and say, well, that was true. Friends, it was once popular in our country to segregate based on race. What is popular will never get you closer to truth. Others seek to find truth and experience. But let me warn you, the devil can give you an experience. He can give you often a, a he can get you all worked up. We often sometimes can seek truth in community, and that can be a good thing. We need one another to help us seek after truth. But friends, the devil can form a social club and create something and put a sign outside and call it a church. Others try to seek truth within. And friends, let me tell you something, the devil knows your heart far better than you do, and he would love for you to follow your heart right into the pits of hell. John, in the midst of this, gives us a word of encouragement and hope. It might sound like all bad news, but John really is an encourager. He really is an optimist at heart, and he gives us one of the first steps to engaging with false teaching around us. He says, we must be aware, but not afraid. He says, friends, you need to be aware. There's false teaching out there. There's people that are going to teach false doctrine. People who will exalt things other than Jesus and teach wrong about Jesus. And we need to be aware, but friends, we do not need to be afraid. Look at verse 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome him. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He says, dearly loved believers, don't be ignorant of the world's falsehoods, but don't be shaken by it either. Why? He says, because we overcome the world by the spirit that dwells in us. The unholy, spirit can, can, the unholy spirits can gain as much power as they want, but they can never overcome the child of God. They can never defeat the spirit of truth. We need to be reminded that in Christ, we are on the winning side, not the culture. I love how people say, don't you want to be on the right side of history? I'm like, I am. I'm on the side of the one who's authoring history and who's moving it according to his will. You may look around and say the world is going to hell in a handbasket, but in truth, the world is headed toward recreation in the hands of our heavenly father. He's guiding and directing the world, and we overcome because Jesus has overcome. He rose from the dead, and we're in union with him. Romans 8, 11 says this, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and it does, by the way, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, through his spirit who dwells in you. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So why do we fear what this world may do? We need to be aware, but we do not need to be afraid. We need to follow teaching and teachers that are serious about truth, that are grounded in doctrine, that are unwavering in their conviction. Wishy-washiness is not from God, it's from Satan. 
And John says, when examining a spiritual teaching or a teacher, do the doctrinal test. Who do they exalt? What do they teach about Jesus? But John's got a second test. And it's just as important as the first. He has second, the authority test. The authority test. Look at verse 5. They, being the false teachers, are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. He tells us the authority test is multifaceted, but so important. The first question to ask of the authority test is, who do they listen to? Who does the teacher listen to? Where did they get their info from? Notice the contrast between verse 4 and 5. Believers are from God. The false teachers are from the world. Believers speak what God says. False teachers say what the world says. Consider their authority. He says, ask, are they getting what they're saying from first from the book of 1 Corinthians or the book of 1 Opinions? The best question when responding to discerning spiritual truth is to say, what chapter and verse, please? Where did you get that? Is that back in the maps? Where did you get that? Sometimes the best question to any claim is, who says? Let me tell you this. Sometimes the who says question takes a little while. Authorities aren't always determined right away. Sometimes you have to examine the info from your, for yourself. Sometimes it doesn't come out till way later that a particular teacher or person was driven by worldly motives or worldly applause. This is why the most important thing you can do is practice the Proverbs 18.17 principle. I think this will change your life. Proverbs 18.17. Look at this. The one who states his case first seems right until another comes along and examines them. In other words, he says this. Sometimes the best thing to do when you get a piece of information is not to instantly share it to your social media. Or to come and share it with a bunch of other people. Did you hear this? Maybe it's best to wait, let further information come, and make informed decisions rather than a hasty one. I often do this with spiritual teachers. People will ask me, hey, what do you think about so-and-so? And I might have some thoughts to offer on so-and-so teacher, but I always usually tell folks, hey, time will tell if they remain faithful. Time will tell what will happen with this teacher, time will tell if what they believe will manifest itself in something more dangerous. Because heresy often takes time to grow. And sometimes it takes time to tell who someone's authority is. So we've got to ask, who do they listen to? And we also need to ask, second, who are they teaching for? Who is the false teacher teaching for? Did you notice the end of verse 5? This is so important. We could skip right over this. But verse 5 is incredible. Look at this. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world and see it, and the world listens to them. The world listens to them. I don't care if it's popular. I don't care how many people have benefited from it. I don't care if it has a following. I don't care if it has other ministries that are supporting them or giving them a platform. If they desire the praises of the world or receiving the praises of the world, then friends, they are in a dangerous place. We are in a dangerous place if we have gotten to the point where we long for the world's applause. Remember, 1 John even reminds us later in chapter 4 that as Jesus was, so we are. And if the world does not accept him... And did not receive him. It's not going to accept and receive us. Teachings that won't get them crucified probably aren't teachings of the crucified. If they desire the world's applause, they're going to miss out on heaven's applause. Be careful what is popular, what's getting attention, or what is new and hip and hot. If the world receives it, God likely rejects it. So how do you know who to listen to? He says, check the teacher's authority. Who are they listening to? Where are they getting this from? But also, do they teach for the world's approval? Because if they're teaching for the world's approval, friends, they're going to be all over the place in a matter of years, sometimes even months now. Things shift so quickly. Verse 6 shows us what we must look for. Look at this. 1 John 4, 6. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. 
Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Here John says, listen to us. He says, listen to the apostles. Listen to those who, as 1 John chapter 1, verse, verse, the first four verses says, the ones who have seen and touched and examined the resurrected Jesus and have been commissioned by him. Listen to those who walked with him, not those who don't know what they're talking about. John's bold here. Here's what he says. If you know God, you will listen to the apostles. So what he says, John says it, listen to us, listen to the apostles. He says, if you know God, you'll listen to Paul and Peter and James and John because they were there. And they've been commissioned by God and they've given us God's word. And there is a draw in our day toward an apostleless, Jesus-only Christianity. You've probably seen or heard this. Well, I don't really care what Paul's got to say. I want to go back here to the red letters, to what Jesus has to say. But let me tell you, that simply isn't possible. This is part of the reason I believe Jesus never actually self-dictated any of the books of the Bible. Because everything we know about him, we have via the writings of his disciples. Think about this. There's people who say, well, I reject the apostles, but I think I should just obey Jesus and love God and love others. And then my question is, well, what book's that from? The book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And who, who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? These, the, what book is it written in, friends, if someone is seeking to lessen the authority of God's word and to lessen the authority of the apostles, the Bible says, mark them. 1 John 4 says, this is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Do they listen to Jesus' commissioned messengers? Do they listen to God's word? Or do they seek to sort of, well, I'm going to pick and choose exactly what I want and how I want it. Because I just think the Bible is sort of like Subway. I'm just going to have a little bit of this and a little bit of this, but I'm going to leave that. Friends, the Bible is not like that. We need to embrace all of God's Word and be people who embrace it all, even the maps in the back. Friends, John is telling us that all spiritual teaching we need to test with a doctrinal test. With an authority test. And John closes with a third test that complements the previous two. He gives us third, the love test. The love test. John repeats this in multiple ways throughout the chapter. I'm going to look, I'm going to kind of fly through a few of these. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Verse 11 and 12. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Verse 20 and 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his neighbor, he's a liar, for he does not know. For he who does not love his brother whom he can see cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. John says, hey, watch out for people who do not love others. John roots the call to love our neighbor in the very essence of God. He says, God is love. Therefore, to not love others is a sign that we don't know God ourselves. Jesus says we don't simply recognize false teaching by its divergence from orthodoxy, but also its divergence in orthopraxy. In other words, false teaching is not simply false doctrine, but also false practice. It's not simply that they don't know and love the true God. False teaching can even mean leading you to not love your neighbor as you're called to. Not living how God would call you to live. Friends, you, somebody, and you'll see this all the time, there'll always be these kids that'll come right out of seminary. And friends, let me tell you, there's a cage stage coming out of seminary. Some people come out, have the, the degree and a big head, and they're just a jerk. <laughs> Friends, let me tell you, you can have all the knowledge in the world and live completely opposed to it. And John says, watch out for that one. He says, if they do not love their neighbor, 
They're a liar, they're a false teacher, and they do not love God. The devil would want nothing else than for God's people to live and look like the world. That God's people would define love by the culture rather than by Christ. In fact, he even roots the call to love our neighbor in the work of Jesus. Verse 9. 1 John 4, verse 9. Look at this. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. If we fail to love, we have failed to understand how God has loved us. And Jesus came and sought us out. Jesus came and died as a payment for our sins. And he rose again that we might live through him. A proper understanding of the gospel changes vertically how we relate to God. That we're adopted as sons and daughters and we're loved by God. And that means that this love means we have nothing to fear on the day of judgment. But also changes horizontally how we love our neighbors. God has displayed his love toward us so that we might love others. Friends, we've been inundated with all kinds of supposed spiritual teaching. I tell you to go on YouTube and look it up, but don't. There's some wild stuff on YouTube that you don't want anything to do with, I promise. Sometimes I get people to send, sometimes people send me some of that in Messenger, and I'm like, I don't know whether to respond to this or just pretend I didn't see it. <laughs> but behind every teaching, you know, is a spirit at work. And in our day, it's more important than ever to discern the spirits and to test the truth by doctrine, by authority, and by love. Let me close by getting personal. Because this has as much to do with you as it does who you listen to. This is the last point. We don't simply need these tests to discern the teaching of others. We need this test to discern the truth of our own testimony. John isn't simply writing this to test other spirits. He's wanting to, you to discern the spirit that is leading you. John has given this. Let me tell you, John, I often like to call him Dr. John. Because he's, the, he's kind of a doctor for our souls a little bit. And he wrote the book of 1 John to help discern our fellowship with God and the health of our relationship with God. Think of it sort of like a, he wrote this book to be sort of a soul checkup. And to check in on you and how you're doing in your discipleship and to check in on how you're doing following Jesus. And so he would ask you questions like, how is your doctrine? Are you believing what the Bible says? Have you even considered asking, what does the Bible say about X, Y, Z? And going and discovering and digging in and doing the hard work of reading and praying and discovery and thinking and, and looking at what others have to say about this and considering it and weighing it. Do we believe that Jesus is both God and man? That he died on the cross for our sins and rose again? Have we ever given consideration to all of these things and weighed our own doctrine? Or are we just sort of content to kind of just walk with how we're how we're doing. I don't really want to be confronted or change or, or have to change what I think about something. Oh, the horror. He'd ask us, who is our authority? Is Jesus the Lord, the boss of our life? Or are we really the boss of our life? And whatever we want to think, whatever's popular, whatever will get me the most Instagram likes or the most followers on TikTok. Or do, and do we live lives marked by love for God and love for neighbor? Where have we been in the midst of all of it? And are we living how God would have us to live? These are why John writes some of this, is to help discern our own testimonies, the truth of our own spiritual life. And today, we're going to have a moment here in a bit to do business with God. Some of us may have heard these tests and gone, I'm not doing too well. <laughs> or maybe we simply realize, hey, maybe I've never really been a, a disciple of Jesus. I've been kind of going through the motions, and I've never really thought about the, what I believe or who my authority is or how I love. And, well, that can be hard to swallow the good news that you realized it today, and not when it was too late. Because God stands ready to receive you through faith. Even if you've been sort of just playing the game, walking the, walking the walk, trying to check all the boxes, 
God's ready to receive you and have a real communion and relationship with you through faith. That's why Jesus came. He came and died and rose again, even for the hypocrites and the pretenders, so that you could have real life in him. For others, this checkup may come back and really be an encouragement to you. You're doing fine. Things are great. And that's kind of what we hope it would do for some of us and encourage us on in our doctrine, authority, and love. And for others, it may just mean a, a change in our habits is necessary. Maybe we need to kind of change who we're listening to, or maybe how much we're listening to, to, to this or that. Maybe it just means turning off the news for the evening and cracking open the Bible a little bit. Maybe it means slowing down on the Netflix and spending a little bit of time with God in prayer. Maybe a reminder that we aren't listening to God together with others. Because let me tell you, one of the most important things you can do is, yes, listen to God personally, but also listen to God with other people. Because sometimes our ears get a little clogged, and we need some other people to help us hear correctly. Whatever it is you need to do, there's going to be a time here in a minute. You can come forward and pray here at the front. You can pray with me. You can pray right where you are. Whatever you need to do, do business with God. But the invitation stands open. In a world looking for truth, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Let's stand and let's pray together. Father God, you have loved us. And Lord, you've not left us out in this world to discern truth from error alone. You've not left us out here just to wander and feel the falsehood. But you've told us to test the spirits. And you've given us the Holy Spirit to enable us to do that. So Lord, I pray today, if there's anybody following after unholy spirits or spirits of the culture, Lord, that they would turn now by faith to you. Lord, that you would free them from those influences and that they would walk in full obedience and love for you as the Lord over their life. I pray for others who maybe just need to rededicate themselves to the truth, that you would do a work in them in these next moments in their hearts to give their whole life and their whole heart, even who they listen to on a daily basis, to you. And Lord, I pray you would empower us by your spirit to walk and to live in love. And Lord, I pray in these next moments you would have your way in this invitation and in this time of doing business with you. And we ask and we pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.